Hi, everybody. This is Pam Coey, and um, I'm very honored to have one of the owners of Radius Gallery, Jason Neal. And he and his wife, Lisa Simon, run this very contemporary and wonderful gallery in Missoula, Montana. And I'm very lucky to be in one of their current exhibitions with other artists. And so here's Jason to, uh, we're going to be talking about the work I have in the exhibit. And um, so here's Jason. You know, one of the things I, that appeals to me strongly in your work is that there's often a mix and sometimes I feel like even a little bit of a tension between um, a kind of clear uh, geometric pattern and, and almost a kind of rigidity and sometimes like even clearly, um, you know, there's a technique used where it was not sort of necessarily done by hand, but you're creating these like very sort of straight lines or clear, you know, um, rigidly uh, geometric shapes. And that's always kind of intermixed with, with, with um, elements of the lexicon, I guess, that are much more fluid and flowy and, and um, spontaneous feeling, at least. And I just, uh, I really like that combination. I think you often just nail it so perfectly. And I wonder, I guess, if that, um, if that combination of sort of rigid and loose is something that you know in a broad way kind of informs your approach to a painting yeah and i think that what you just said and the way you described it it just the entire time you were talking about that made me think about um if i look back on my life and that's a, <laughs> it's getting to be a long time now <laughs> it's a lot of years um i've always struggled between this rigid structure of like who you're supposed to be, who you're expected to be, who your parents want you to be, you know, and who you even think that you should be versus on the other side for me, and this is really, I'd say in the last, you know, maybe 20, 25 years that I've actually been able to break loose of that structure. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the structure is not still very much part of my life. And so Having, uh, again, the grid perhaps or some other type of structure that I might, I might use from time to time gives me that, that kind of familiarity of, of like, okay, yeah, that, that is part of who you used to be. But then it also, when I put that in there, gives me the freedom and the permission to like go the opposite direction, uh, try com something completely different, knowing that I'm, I, I'm, I'm honoring both who I was and who I am. It's, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't think that we ever lose our past. I, I think part of like being an artist as I grow older, it becomes, there's some things that become easier. And that is like having, having more information, more data, like more of like looking back. I mean, obviously I have way more to look back on now than I would have as a teen. And I'm actually really happy I didn't, I didn't major in art because I, I think that would have been a disaster. There's something about coming, you know, coming to know who you are, because um, I really want to be this authentic artist. I, I want to look at my art and have it speak to me in a way that I know it couldn't have spoken to me so many years ago. Um, it's, it's putting together so many little pieces of information. And um, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think the visual language that you, that you're working in is intriguing and have you know, as long as I've known your work. And it also strikes me as very um, kind of 21st century, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's abundant and it's heterogeneous and it feels multicultural and, and um, it's kind of got all of these qualities going for it. And, and I also think that it's also feels very, I mean, I guess this is just testament to your sophistication as a, as a painter, but it, it it kind of feels lasting, like it, it, it feels, um, it sustains. I always feel good about selling a painting of yours because I'm, I'm quite sure that the person who buys it is gonna be delighted, not just when they take it home and put it on the wall, but you know, a year from then or five years from then or 10 years from then, your, your work has a way of um, uh, kind of reflecting the interests of the, of the viewer without just sort of catering to that, you know? I mean, it's this very, each piece is a very distinct thing, but 
Um, I mean, I know from experience of having your work in, in my home that it's over time, that it's, um, it kind of keeps giving uh, in, in a very compelling way. And, you know, that's, there's, there's other paintings or, or artworks that I have, you know, you can imagine an artwork that's, you know, a painting of a sailboat on a lake and there's a beautiful sort of sunset behind it. It's a lovely painting, you know, it's beautiful and it, and it absolutely gives off this great, wonderful feeling. But that's sort of its job is to reliably give off that wonderful feeling, you know? Yes. And, and that's why you kind of have it is because you want to revisit that feeling again and again. Whereas I feel like your work can really kind of almost catch you off guard one day when you wake up and you sort of see it for the 10,000th time and it feels like it's something new or different. Um, so I wonder, I guess the, I'm rambling on here, but the question is that, you know, you're obviously a, a critic of your own work and you must make paintings and think about, you know, this one is maybe more successful than another or, or at least more um, s significant in your mind. And I just wonder if that's, if that's an aspect that you as an artist can sort of read. Do you finish a painting and think sometimes like, oh, that one, that one's sort of got sustainability. So, you know, like it's, it's kind of dialed into being um, maybe somehow more timeless than another. I don't know. It's an odd thing to talk about with respect to abstract art and what qualities would make that. I'm not sure I know what qualities would make that, but certainly some paintings do that more than others, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm writing down a few notes here so I don't, I don't lose track because um, yeah, there are a lot of things that I think about. You're right. Um, I, I don't think anyone's more critical of their own work than the artists themselves, you know, and I am, uh, I have a master class where I have a lot of uh, students and I critique their work every other week. And I've done this for about a year and a half now. And I, what I've realized about myself is that number one, it's easier for me to critique other people's work than my own. Mm -hmm. um, somehow when it's my own work, I sometimes have to hear my voice critiquing other people so that I can sort of look at it objectively because like I get too much perspective on your own work. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the trouble of any artist is that they're too close to it. Um, and we, you know, you want to kind of see it through the eyes, like through fresh eyes. So sometimes my advice is just tuck it away. Don't look at it for a while. Then mm -hmm. when you sneak up on it, it'll be like, oh, whose painting is that? Oh, it's mine. <laughs> I can actually you look at do it. that trick of where you'll like take a picture of your painting and then look at it in a photograph and those sort of things or look at it in a mirror or something. So many ways. You're right. Absolutely. That's why I'm, I'm really big at documenting what I do, even like close up areas, um, far away areas. I'll kind of like get some weird lighting on it. And I kind of want to, part of it is like getting to know that work uh, very personally. And um, as far as like, yeah, I, this reminds me of something I said recently on a call. And that is that, you know, although we strive for work that we love, we strive for work that we feel really good about putting out in the universe. Um, we strive for work that's purely authentic and the very best we can do. And the ultimate thing is, do we love it, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Do you love the work you're putting out there? But that, you know, a painting is a creation. And I, I compare this to the metaphor of having children because we love our children, but they're not perfect. And um, at least mine aren't. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, boys. Um, <laughs> this may come as a shocker, I know, but, um, but none of us are perfect. And so whereas I was stuck in the past of like my art had to be perfect. And I think that... Uh, in our own heads, you know, I know how to create work that sells. I know how to create work that quote unquote, a lot of people would think is perfect, mm -hmm. at least for the majority, right? But you were talking about the word universal, at least for me personally, like, I know a lot of my audience was very happy with that work. So when I departed from that, it was hard because I went from this person creating work that was universally uh pleasing and pretty and made people happy and like why aren't you painting that way anymore and it's like um ultimately if it's not universal for me then it doesn't matter and speaking to the fact that you're saying um at least with the work you've seen of mine that 
maybe every time you see something different, a new perspective. I mean, I, I think part of that is because uh, for me, so much emotion goes into work. Um, it's the emotional content and there's a lot of emotion in line work. There's a lot of emotion in mark making um, because it's active and energetic. And depending on how the artist is feeling, I still feel like drawing is the most direct uh, uh, transfer. Like you yeah. can see the most through the direct, like simplest thing. Just like the cave drawings were so powerful because all they had was this mark making tool. They didn't have a lot of colors. They didn't have a lot of fancy you know, paints or mediums. They had just this one direct thing. And so um, for me, mark making is distilling myself down to almost like the bare minimum being an infant, you know, and, but everything else comes from a tremendous body of understanding and knowledge. Um, and like this morning, I was talking to Byron about my husband, Byron, about, uh, you know, he, he's a scientist and quite a good one. And he's talking about, um, we, we kind of have some parallels in that, uh, neither one of us feels tremendously gifted or talented, you know, it's more about, um, creativity, but then I was telling him, yeah, it, like creativity in science is really important and obviously creativity in art, but, um, I think it's, uh, something that, you know, you start with whatever you have and it's not a question of talent. Um, creativity has to grow. And the more that, the more you do it, the more it grows because we, we all have a certain amount of creativity, a certain amount of, you know, talent, but I really don't like the word talent at all. I, I really, I, I really do not think that art has much to do with talent. I think it has more to do with, um, because how can you say that, you know, you, you got 10 artists and they're all doing the best work they can. And, you know, sure some sell and some don't or whatever, some are famous, some are not, but is it talent or just that artists like um, nose to the grindstone, they put their hours in, they, they did the experiments. They, they kept asking how, how can I better express myself? Is that talent or is that more passion and just putting in the time, the 10,000 hours, you know, I, I really don't think talent comes into the picture. And I, it just makes me, me think of like what my parents said to me, oh, you know, if you have talent, you don't have to go to art school. And I believe that, you know, I, cause I, yeah, I, I could do some things without a lot of training, but I later found that I hit a, I hit a, a wall. Um, I was doing everything I was supposed to do as an artist. I was selling work. It was pretty people bought it, you know, all the things that the typical art world would say, Oh, you're a success. But none of that meant anything to me. And all of that was the talent I had. So talent is like the whole idea of talent is so limiting. And uh, to me, art is so much more just as in science, you know, Byron, he's constantly like saying, oh, I'm not a very good scientist. And yet, you know, I look at him and he's like, he just submitted a paper for nature. And, um, and I'm like, because he's always comparing how smart he is. Well, you can take the word smart and compare that to talent, but as in science too, like it's the creativity that he has that has helped him get as far as he's gotten. And so it's the creativity. Now creativity is totally different because that is like an ever giving spring. And if you can keep that going, I would much rather be known as a creative person than a talented person. This little blue number over here is uh, certainly um, inching toward minimalism, I think, relative to your other work. Yeah, you're right. Um, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's a very simple palette. and um, But what's not minimalist about it, I think, for me, when I think of true minimalism, it's um, in general meant to be at least of the work I can think of. I think for me, like I, I did go with a simpler palette. There's only one color um, with white, but um, for me, like I needed to have the mark making in the lines, which, which give a sense of energy. Plus the thickness of the paint varies so that you're not seeing just, mm -hmm. you know, a truly minimalist painting wouldn't have any mo movement necessarily. Right. Yeah. So, but I agree that, yeah, the palette was kept simple and um, the lines all, all go in one direction. So there are certain elements that were um, intentionally kept 
like restricted has been restricted. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the very thickness of the encaustic paint over the white um, underpainting, which in it, which in itself was pretty flat, but not not flat as glass. So therefore, depending on how thick that blue was on top of the white, there's some variation. And and any variation to me in a minimalist work is is starting to leave that world of minimalism. You know. Right. right. Yeah. Well. Um... So I want to I want to ask you more about uh, some things that we've kind of touched on or you've sort of referred to and hopefully doesn't get too redundant here. But um, you know you were speaking earlier about sort of what you sort of want a painting to convey or what you were going for, um, and I guess I'm just curious if you know when you're painting, not necessarily before you start, but in the in the course of making a painting, do you become kind of clear minded, not even necessarily on an intellectual level, but on some level about what you want this painting to convey. And, and I don't know if that's even necessarily from a, another person's perspective or just from your perspective. I think, you know, one of the, one of the, maybe to put it a little bit differently, I can imagine you have the experience where, you know, you think you're closing in on the completion of a painting and you step back and you just think it's just not there yet. It's just, you yeah. know, it needs something or maybe it needs something removed or something changed, but it, it's not there yet. And I guess I'm wondering like, what is, what is that a reaction to? I mean, it must be the aesthetic qualities of the painting to an extent, but is it also in relationship to some notion you have in mind for what this painting needs to be? 